John met my wife Janie through a mutual friend. He and Janie got along well and started spending time together regularly. John never really threatened me. He was always pleasant and polite. But when you're fucking someone else's wife, you tend to be cautious. They had fun snooping around while I was at work or away. But as fun as it was, something was missing. They told me about it later. It was a December night when they decided to complete the missing piece of their puzzle. Janie invited John over to our house to play cards after dinner. He arrived around 8 p.m., and Janie greeted him warmly. She gave him a hug, which I don't think was all that unusual. After all, they were friends. We sat down on the couch first, and I got John a beer from the fridge. When I returned, John and Janie were sitting together holding hands and putting them on his leg. What's going on, guys? I asked, as the look on their faces was that of someone who had to break some terrible news. Well, honey, she said, we have something to tell you, but we'd rather you sit down. I did the sensible thing and sat down, and she went on to explain. John and I have been having a sexual relationship for the past two months. You see, there was a chemistry between us that was stronger than both of us, and one thing led to another. We care about each other. She was being reasonable. I care about you too, and I didn't want to cheat on you, so we have a proposition we'd like to propose. John continued where Janie had left off. You see, we can't stop seeing each other. There's too much there to ignore, but we wanted to make sure you participated in our little date. We'll continue to have sex on a regular basis, but you'll be there with us to watching. Maybe lend a hand here or there, he said, smiling. Janie continued. It's actually going to be a lot of fun for you. I've looked at your search history, and I know you like horn instruction porn. She rolled her eyes at my embarrassment. I've seen the history in your browser, and you're always searching for horn-inflicting relationships on Pornhub. So I know deep down that's really what you want. Honestly, it's what's best for our marriage, too. John started again. So all we need from you is a signed document. A simple statement that all parties within the contract agree to these terms. I looked over the papers Janie had pulled out of her purse. Some of the circumstances indicated that she and John were to be released from any wrongdoing if the agreement didn't work out, and I decided to start divorce proceedings. Some clauses authorized various forms of physical contact, such as kissing, hugging, and even showering and sleeping together. I sat with a dry mouth, not knowing what to say. Janie made her point. Look, I love you, but I also love John and what he can do for me. It's nothing personal, but the way he makes me feel is something I can't just give up. I know he feels the same way about me. John nodded his head in agreement. So sign the contract, baby. This is how it's going to be from now on. What was I supposed to do? I certainly didn't want a divorce, but I had no idea how I would react to seeing Janie having another man. I looked at the two of them again. Their hands were still interlocked, but now on her thigh. Janie looked at me seriously and said, maybe this will convince you to sign. I watched as she pulled John's face to hers and started kissing him. He returned the favor and put his hand on her cheek. Part of me couldn't believe what I was watching. There was my wife kissing another man. I didn't want to admit it, but the longer they both kissed, the stronger my erection became. I tried to pull back and hide it, but John noticed it first. Look, he likes it, he exclaimed. It was then that Janie held out a pen to me. I looked at the contract with the pen in my hand and sighed. I couldn't hide it from them, and I wasn't sure if it was the right thing to do. I had researched quite a few stories about horn admonishing sex, but this was for a case I was working on. You see, I'm a private investigator, and I do a lot of divorce work, in addition to the security company I own. Obviously, I didn't do enough research, so I went into investigator mode which I'm sure they didn't expect. I pulled out my miniature tape recorder and hit the record button. Just to be clear, I wanted to record our conversation to eliminate any future disagreements, just for my own peace of mind. Do you understand? There's a lot of legal nonsense in here. I noticed that you two have already signed and notarized your signatures. Yes, John said. We just wanted to save time. We knew you'd go along with it. Geraldine, our notary, will be here soon to notarize your consent. Then we can start enjoying ourselves. He was shining like a kid at Christmas. Just to be clear, 
How long have you two been sleeping behind my back? I can't believe I didn't realize anything, Janie squeaked. Well, we've been married for four and a half years, and for two and a half of those years, John and I have had an affair. And please don't mention it in those terms. He's my soulmate, and we've been making love the whole time. Really? Now I'm overdoing it a little bit. Come on, Richard. Don't get so hung up on yourself. She's a loving enough woman for both of us. I looked at them and realized my marriage was over. I picked up my pen, made my mark, and stood up. I hope this will satisfy you. I showed them the document. I scribbled, oh, fuck no, on the signature. Janie looked at the contract and shrieked. Sorry, asshole, I don't share well. Now look at this, John. I shook the beer bottle in my hand, pressing my thumb to my mouth. I took the contract and folding it, slipped it into my back pocket. Then I pointed the bottle at my soon-to-be ex-wife and the asshole who used to be my friend and took my thumb off the neck. A jet of liquid hit them both right in the face. I turned around, grabbed my briefcase, laptop, and jacket, and despite demands to get back here and where I thought I was going, opened the front door. I ran into Geraldine, the notary. Your show, bitch. You must be Richard. Oh, fuck. You don't lie, bitch. I got in my pickup and backed up to the beginning of the driveway. I engaged the drive and turned the wheels to the left, rolling across the front lawn and through the rose bushes. As I drove off the curb, I grazed the left rear panel of the jerk's Lexus. I know what I did was juvenile, so sue me. At least he was still alive. I drove to her parents' house. I decided I was going to be proactive, and while I loved my in-laws dearly, I wasn't going to be the bad guy. My cell phone was bursting with messages and texts. Finally, the inbox was full, and after a while, the calls and text messages stopped. I pulled up to her parents' house and got out. I pressed the doorbell and soon heard, okay, okay, I'm going. The porch light came on, and then I found myself face to face with her father. Judge Thomas Smith seemed to be in a bad mood. Richard, what are you doing here at this hour? And where's Janie? I don't know where the hell she is, certainly not on this fucking planet. My father-in-law and mother-in-law have always treated me with love and respect, even though they had a son in addition to my soon-to-be ex-wife. I handed the judge the contract and put my mini-magnet on the kitchen table. What the hell is this? Read it, I said. He started reading and his eyes rounded. Is it true? He asked. I turned on the tape recorder and it started where I asked if I could record the conversation so there would be no misunderstanding. While it was playing, his wife was listening to it, and suddenly the robe she was holding closed, opened, and her hand reached up to her face, covering her mouth. She agged, and the robe fell open, exposing the sexy black nightgown she was wearing. Well, I thought, his evening is ruined. He finished reading and looked at me. I don't think there's any way around it, is there? What would you do in my situation? His eyes lowered and he shuddered. I understand, son. Just at that moment, their old-fashioned home phone rang. His wife came to the phone. Hello? Mama, if Richard's there, I need to talk to him right now. Her father grabbed the phone receiver. About what, silly? Are you two in some kind of trouble? There was a shriek of surprise on the other end of the line. Dad, what are you talking about? This isn't about you or my mother. This is between me and my husband. You must get a contract that clarifies this. Otherwise, you have turned this into a family issue. I heard yelling and, Ooh, no, they know. Her father said into the phone, Goodbye, Janie, and hung up. Dad turned to me and said, Go and get a good night's sleep. Then do what you have to do. Just don't do anything stupid, you understand? Yes, sir. I apologize for everything. It's not your fault, son. Sometimes a snake just sneaks into the garden. I got out, got in my truck, drove to the Hampton Inn, and checked in for the week. I started smashing the mini bar and then collapsed in the bathroom and threw up all over the floor. I dragged myself fully clothed into the shower and hosed myself down. After stripping off my clothes and collapsing on the bed, I slipped into dreamland. The next morning, I woke up and cleaned myself up again. I realized I didn't have any clean clothes, so I called another good friend of mine, Gerald O'Toole, the one who doesn't sleep with my wife, and asked him to buy something fresh from Walmart and bring them to the hotel, room 819. 
He was a little concerned about what was going on, so I told him I'd explain everything to him when he got there. Oh, and grab some Egg McMuffins and plenty of coffee. Hurry up, buddy. Then I contacted my office and ordered my two best guys to start surveillance on the whore and the asshole. I called the bank and blocked all my accounts, personal and business. I canceled all of our joint charge cards after I paid them off. I then called and disconnected her cell phone, which was part of my business plan with the company, and then called and ordered all utilities in our home disconnected. I called my friend who was a lawyer and she recommended a divorce attorney. My brother is very good if you want maximum bloodshed. Tell him I sent you. From the looks of it, it will be a sure thing and could be a landmark decision. I called her brother and about that time Gerald showed up. I got dressed and we bought groceries for breakfast. I filled him in on the events of yesterday and at the same time told my future attorney what had happened and what I wanted. He told me to report to his office with everything I needed at about 3 p.m. We would work out a battle plan. Gerald couldn't believe his ears. I can't believe she could have done that, not to cheat, but to offer a written contract and notarized. Tell me about it. There's something else I need to do. I'll get back to you a little later and bring you up to speed. No problem, buddy. I never fully trusted John, and I think I know why now. If you need anything, anything at all, Astrid and I are always here for you. Astrid had been his wife for ten years and always treated me like a little brother. He left and I looked in the mirror. I looked like shit. Definitely an improvement over yesterday. I got out and went to the bank. I was immediately ushered into the senior vice president's office. I'm not a billionaire, but between my personal accounts and my business accounts, it was a significant amount of money. He jumped on me. I don't understand your actions. Sure, it's your money and you can act as you see fit, but is there anything we can do to change your mind? Guess where John worked. He was a senior financial consultant at a bank, so I put the contract on the vice president's desk and then turned on the tape recorder. His eyes clouded over as he read the contract, but when he realized what he was reading and what he was hearing, his complexion went from pink to transparent. Surely this must be some kind of joke. If it is, I'm not laughing. I can't continue to do business with an institution that employs an asshole who has my wife behind my back. My voice rose to a low roar, and I'm sure the surrounding staff heard every word. I took the contact from his shaking hand and picked up the recorder. I wondered how many other customers had been treated the same way. You may inform John Samuels that legal documents will be served to him shortly. Good day, sir. I turned and left. As I crossed his office, I heard him barking, Get Samuels in here immediately! I chuckled. I stopped at the stationary supply station and printed out three copies of the contract. I figured it was best not to show the original to anyone until it was in the hands of my attorney. Then I went to my insurance agent. Guess who's soon-to-be ex-wife worked there? I was ushered into the office of the owner, Miss Daphne Loria. I thought I heard a squashed Richard as I walked through their offums. That's great, I smiled. Miss Loria stood up as I entered and shook my outstretched hand. Richard, it's good to see you. What can we do for you? She was nervous and looked clearly out of place. I assume you know why I'm here, Daphne. I'm canceling all my insurance with your company, effective immediately, and I'd appreciate a refund check right now. I can't do business with anyone who would hire a lying, cheating whore bitch. Just one minute, Richard. Your personal feelings can't affect the way my company does business. I didn't see or hear anything. I tossed a copy of the contract on her desk and stared at her. Do you need to listen to the tape recording? She read the three pages and briefly familiarized herself with the notary's seal and signature. A shiver shook her upper body. One moment, please. She pressed the intercom button. Janie, could you please come into my office now? A few seconds later, a visibly shaken, soon-to-be ex-wife entered the office. Yes, Miss Loria. Janie, you're fired. Get off your desk and leave. Immediately. Janie staggered and then passed out. Several people came over and fussed around her. Miss Loria stood up and asked if my decision still stood. I stood up and shook her hand. It's nice to deal with a highly moral professional. I think I can leave my business where it is. I turned and walked out, stepping over my recumbent ex-wife, and drove to the attorney's office. My attorney's name was Nathaniel Sampson. He was a little older than me, but he looked younger. 
He was savvy. He invited me into his office. He asked if I wanted something to drink and then asked his secretary to get us some water. Now, Richard, I've talked to my sister, and she seems to think I'm going to like it. So, what have you got? I prepared the original contract and then turned on my tape recorder. The tape ended and he listened to it, but he seemed more interested in the contract. When it was over, he pressed the intercom button. His secretary paralegal walked in. Bethany, take this tape recording and make two copies, then put the original in the safe. Buy Mr. Daniels a new tape and bring the tape recorder back. He went back to reading and kept glancing at me from time to time. Finally, he put the contract aside and looked at me. This is real, isn't it? No one could come up with something like this. He thought for a moment, then looked at me. Okay, so what do you want to do? I want to crucify them. I want to hurt them so badly that they can't get a job or have any kind of social life together. I want them to pay big time. He smirked slightly and smiled at me. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I wouldn't refuse to participate in this for any money in the world. The first thing we're going to do is get a notary here and question her. I've worked with her before, and I think she'll be gracious. We'll have our own notary here, and we'll do everything legally. Then we will authenticate the tape and put it to good use. We'll insist on a jury trial and whip them. Oh, I said. I think they're both out of a job. I've raised a little ruckus at the bank and at her workplace. Even better if we just increase the pressure. If we get a jury trial, I'll take the case pro bono. I like it already. That's the thing. They don't have a libel or slander claim. We have proof that everything they said is true. Until we back away from the facts, they can't do anything or say anything. The light slowly flickered on in my mind. They fucked themselves up. We got a notary, and when they laid it all out to her, she jumped all over them. She testified that they wanted to have their cake and eat it, too. Nathaniel made an appointment with the judge and laid out our case. He shook his head and looked at me. I feel for you, Mr. Daniels. If I can, I'll do everything in my power to make things right. But are you sure you want the jury to hear that? My attorney has intervened. Your Honor, my client wants maximum pain and suffering for the woman who is technically still his wife and the man she was consorting with. He wants their marriage dissolved and for her to leave the union with nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay, counselor, prepare this and let's see if the other parties agree. We notified the other two and told them to sign the papers or hire an attorney. They howled. They were almost broke because they had their utilities back on and because they were unemployed. But she refused to sign, and he was counting on a large settlement. They finally hired some passerby to represent them. They didn't mention the contract or the recording to her lawyer. We set up a meeting at my attorney's office and set the record straight. My attorney checked the recording for timing and authenticity of the audio. We were ready to go. They showed up at 11 a.m., leading her father. I was a little surprised and alarmed. I shouldn't have done this. Janie came toward me as if about to give me a hug. I fought back her attacks and mocked my former friend. She started by saying that it had all been a big misunderstanding and that I had brought holy hell down on both of them. They had both lost their jobs, were nearly destitute, and had no prospects for the future. I drew up a quitclaim deed and handed the house over to her. But with no money, they were quickly going under. They tried to put it up for sale, but they didn't have much luck. She wanted me back in her life, in her bed, and most of all in her bank account. My lawyer answered a question with a question. Are you still seeing Mr. Samuels? Her attorney stated that it was not relevant to the discussion. They are just friends. With those words, my attorney pulled a contract out of his stack of documents and placed it in front of the guy. Let's try this again. He stood facing Janie while her lawyer read the document. Are you still seeing Mr. Samuels? She turned pale and almost fainted. I don't think I want to answer that question. It's too personal. It's all right, Miss Farrell. You'll be able to answer it under oath in court. I became more and more complacent as I watched their lives fall apart. Her lawyer finished reading the contract, and he looked like he was about to get sick. You never mentioned this before, he said. He turned to my lawyer. It's all hearsay. You don't have that kind of real evidence. That's when my lawyer pulled out a sworn affidavit from Miss Geraldine Schultz, their notary public. 
He handed that to the attorney and then assigned a notarized statement from me as to what was said and what was demanded. He then pulled out a tape recording. This is admissible in court because your clients knew this was going on and willingly agreed to it. My guy pressed play and their whole world came crashing down. Their lawyer looked panic-stricken. That's when her father, the judge, spoke up and set things straight. He slammed his palm on the table and looked fiercely at her lawyer. That's enough, Janie. Mr. Hootie, you're fired. Janie, sign the form and get your head out of your ass. Samuels, I want you out tomorrow night. Notice you've been named as a co-defendant in the divorce suit. You'd better get legal representation before Richard rules against you. And Janie, I realize you're not getting anything out of this. I think if you go to court, you'll get even less. Your mother and I are disgusted with you and your behavior. Your brother refuses to bring his wife and children into our home as long as you stay there, so you'd better start looking for another place to sleep. Samuels is your soulmate, and you chose him over your husband, so maybe things will work out for the two of you. I heard him whisper, I sincerely hope not. Turns out Janie's parents were footing the bill for her legal representation. So she signed everything, while Samuels jumped up and ran out of the room. He disappeared off the face of the earth. I had nothing to do with that. KHM. Three months later, I was the only one sleeping in my bed, and I was a single man. Well, that was last night. The Jones sisters promised me they would cheer me up tonight and all tomorrow. Life is good.